okay, uh, this is uh, lecture two. Uh, so in lecture one, we have talked about uh, uh, lattice structure uh, of uh, a crystal, right? Uh, so when we uh, discuss uh, lattice structure, so basically we assume that uh, the atoms are stationary and they are not moving at all, right? And of course, this will only happen at uh, absolute zero uh, temperature. Um, but uh, this will uh, never be achieved, right? So uh, you can reduce the temperature to very, very low value, uh, but it will not go down to uh, zero. So this means that in principle, uh, and so all the materials, and so when we're using all these materials, basically we use them uh, at um, a finite temperature. And in fact, um, for most electronic devices, uh, the operation temperature can be much higher than the room temperature, right? That's because that for all the electronic devices, you need to use uh, to supply current. So when current flows uh, through, uh, solid state materials and it will generate heat, right? So uh, at the finite temperature, and what happens then is so all the atoms um, will um, will not be uh, stationary and will start to move uh, to uh, their surrounding air area, right? And however, in solid state materials, due to uh, very strong interaction uh, between uh, neighboring atoms, and so the atoms can only move at a finite, uh, at a reasonably low uh, temperature. Uh, or finite temperature, and these atoms can only move uh, within a very small range, right? So this basically uh, will give you uh, this uh, uh, something we call a lattice wave. Okay, um, so first of all, there was a temperature. Uh, so the temperature is a measure of average uh, translational uh, kinetic energy uh, associated with uh, uh, some so-called disorder or random uh, microscopic motion of uh, atoms or you know molecules, right? And so, as shown here, uh, this actually is a small uh, cluster of molecules and atoms. So we can see that uh, uh, these molecules and atoms are actually moving uh, very <clears throat> very fast uh, within a small range, right? And of course, the vibration is not strong enough to uh, break all this uh, this uh, uh, atoms or molecules from uh, one another. So there's a reason why they are still uh, stick to each other, all right? And so typically uh, for uh, gas or uh, liquids, and so the molecules and then um, atoms are actually moving in a random directions, all right? And so, um, and although of course, uh, again, uh, they are basically moving uh, around some sort of equilibrium point, right? And but uh, in uh, solid state materials, and especially in uh, crystals, and then um, uh, the movement of any atom uh, will be constrained by uh, other atoms or over the lattice structures, right? So uh, this will generate uh, some sort of motion we call collective motion, uh, which is different from uh, uh, this random motion. So here, for example, let me show you an example. Uh, this is a one dimensional crystal, and so you can see that uh, the atoms can only and move uh, along uh, this line. And so they, they move uh, to the right or the left of the equilibrium position. And, and then uh, the moment of one atom or molecule uh, will be affected by the surrounding you know, uh, atoms, especially the nearest the neighbors, right? So this kind of a, a collective motion and we call a lattice wave or lattice vibration wave, right? So uh, in the physics, and we know that uh, uh, all the, the, the matter uh, basically can be uh, represented by two uh, in the picture. One is called particle and the other called wave, right? So it means that uh, uh, this uh, uh, natural vibration itself and, and from a classical point of physics point of view, and it's basically, you can see it's a wave uh, in quantum mechanics. And uh, so we can uh, quantize this wave so once the wave is quantized, and we call a quanta of lattice vibration, uh, that basically is a, a phono, right? So the phono is a very important concept. Uh, for example, uh, later, uh, in the later part of this module, uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, electron transport inside a solid material. So when electrons try to move from one place to another place, and so electron will be, uh, the, move, the moment itself will be obstructed by, uh, of course, a lattice structure, right? So this means that, uh, uh, electrons will, will be scattered by and uh, this lattice, and especially when the light, when the atoms are moving, right? 
So basically, it's an interaction between electron and then this uh, lattice vibration. Um, but uh, uh, you know, electron basically can be treated as both a particle and a wave, right? If a lattice vibration can also be treated as a wave and, and of course, a particle, uh, which is phonon, and then the interaction between electron and the phonon can be treated in a very easy manner. Uh, basically, is a scattering of two particles. This means that uh, uh, when electrons moving inside a crystal, and it will be scattered by uh, the four nodes, right? And then we can uh, deal with this uh, scattering problem uh, in a much uh, 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 easier way, right? And, and similarly, in the second part of this module, and then you will learn optical properties. And so basically, you will, uh, you, you will see how the light, uh, this is a photon, uh, will interact with four nodes and the electrons as well, okay? Um, so now, uh, when we uh, study uh, physics or engineering, uh, it's always important that um, we need to understand the scale of the physical uh, quantity which we are dealing with, right? Uh, so here we are dealing with the temperature. Uh, it's good to look at the range of temperature which can be achieved or can exist uh, in nature, right? And so we start from the small uh, loss of temperature first. And of course, of course, the lowest one is always the uh, absolute, uh, you know, zero uh, temperature, uh, but it's difficult to achieve, right? You can reduce the temperature to very, very low value, uh, but uh, definitely uh, it's difficult to go down to uh, zero Kelvin, right? And for example, uh, in, at a laboratory, and so uh, about 20 to 30 years ago, and the people have developed a technique uh, which you call laser cooling. And so, so what this, so basically, um, you can confine um, the molecules, atoms, or ions uh, into a very small uh, area uh, using, for example, uh, we call uh, a magnetic a field, magnetic trap, right? So once you can trap all these molecules, or you know, uh, anyway, just call small particles, for example, uh, into this small area, and then uh, of course the temperature will be reduced because uh, you make it, uh, all these uh, particles difficult to move around. Um, but uh, they are still not stationary, right? They still can move a little bit. And to further uh, reduce this movement or reduce temperature, and then people have developed this uh, type of laser cooling, right? And laser basically is a type of light, we call coherent light, and then uh, consists of uh, photons. And of course, photons carry uh, uh, momentum, okay? And so when you transfer this linear momentum to and the molecules, Right, then you can actually slow down the movement of all these uh, you know, particles inside this small volume. So eventually, uh, you can reach a temperature uh, which is uh, uh, on the order of a 10 to the power minus 9 or minus you know, 12 Kelvin, that kind of range. Right? And of course, to achieve this, uh, you need a special equipment and also you need the expertise uh, to design an experiment uh, so that you can uh, reach this uh, kind of uh, temperature range. Um, and so when you move up a little bit, you will see another temperature range, which is often um, used in the kind of measure studies, that is called milli Kelvin, right? Uh, it's a 10 to the power of minus three or minus two Kelvin, this kind of range, right? And so of course, again, you need a, a special setup to achieve this. And so when you move up a little bit further and you'll see another temperature range, which is relatively easy to achieve. And it actually is a, a quite a constant temperature. Uh, it's called 4.2 Kelvin. So what this temperature? Uh, this is called liquid helium temperature. This means that uh, if you can uh, make a helium a gas into liquid, and then automatically, and then you will reach this temperature. This means that uh, if you put your object uh, or inside this uh, uh, liquid helium, and then you get this uh, 4.2 Kelvin. Um, and then if you move up further, and you have this uh, uh, liquid nitrogen temperature. Uh, by the way, liquid helium is actually is quite expensive, right? Because it's a byproduct of uh, oil production. So that's why, and so sometimes it can be very expensive, okay? And especially, for example, in Singapore, if you buy uh, this liquid helium, I remember a few years ago, uh, just for about 100 uh, liter that kind of helium, uh, it can cost you uh, more than uh, 3,000 know, Singapore dollars, all right? So that's why sometimes you really have to give up your, re your research when the helium is very, very expensive. Um, and, the, and then compared to liquid helium, of course, liquid nitrogen is uh, much cheaper, right? Uh, so liquid nitrogen, and if you put your sample inside liquid nitrogen, and you can have a temperature of 77 Kelvin, 
right? And of course, it's not uh, low enough, but uh, sometimes it's quite useful. And if you walk around the US campus, uh, you can see a few uh, large liquid nitrogen tank, right? So typically, uh, we just store liquid nitrogen inside the liquid nitrogen tank. And then uh, when we do experiments, we just use a small jewel or a small container, and then to just take the liquid nitrogen from the large tank, and then you can do your experiments, right? Uh, so when you mow up, and then you will have uh, this water frozen temperature. Uh, this is what uh, uh, we all know, right? And then of course, uh, uh, and uh, just move a little bit further, and then you see room temperature is somewhere around here, right? And then uh, about room temperature, and so uh, the temperature range which I'm very familiar with is called our human uh, body temperature. And you can see that amazingly, uh, our uh, human body temperature um, is uh, can only be within a very very small range, right? Just try, just imagine you compare this one with the entire you know temperature scale, right? It's a very very small range. And it basically tells you how fragile our body is. Right? So your, our body temperature cannot be too low, also cannot be too high, and it must be within this range. Um, so I, I think now you have a good understanding of the body temperature because during this uh, uh, COVID-19 outbreak, and then we have to uh, take a temperature at high steady, right? So roughly you know uh, what's the range uh, of your body temperature, right? And then uh, if you look at the high temperature, uh, of course, uh, 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 you can uh, uh, basically cause and uh, uh, all this uh, solid state to uh, to melt, right? So, and uh, these are basically very high temperature. You could do, for example, even diamond, right? You can if the temperature too high, and it will become a liquid or uh, will evaporate it, right? Um, and then uh, the sun surface temperature, you can see that uh, it's about six thousand Kelvin. Okay, so throughout uh, this uh, module, uh, we have. Uh, uh, two types of temperatures. One we call lattice temperature. So basically, the uh, conventional temperature which you are talking about, right? It's a temperature which uh, already reached the equilibrium of a lattice vibration, right? And there's another type of temperature we, we call electron temperature, which we will talk about this one when we uh, discuss electrons in the metal. And that temperature can be very high, uh, but that's not the lattice temperature, right? So this means that uh, uh, a piece of metal, uh, if you hand touch it, uh, can be uh, the temperature very low can, is, is very cool, uh, but the electron inside this material can have a very high temperature. That's called electron temperature. So it's a little bit different concept. All right. So anyway, uh, when we uh, encounter this, uh, we'll uh, give more details. Now, just to uh, give you one example of how important the temperature is, uh, right? So if you look at uh, uh, this um, uh, so-called idle gas, basically uh, gas molecules, which are uh, contained uh, inside a, a small uh, you know, container, right? And then, of course, at the finite temperature, you can see that uh, all these molecules are moving around randomly, right? And so, uh, in this case, uh, you don't see all the molecules uh, as a wave or atom as a wave. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, of course, all uh, objects are basically uh, can be treated as a wave or, or treated just as a you know a physical object, and. And so, so why uh, we cannot see the wave? Uh, that's because that uh, at the high temperature, the wavelength and of this uh, uh, the molecular wave actually varies uh, very small, right? So in quantum mechanics, actually the wavelength uh, we call and the Broglie wavelength uh, basically is called uh, wavelength of natural wave is simply like this, right? So you have a mass here and the temperature and then the uh, constant. So that's why when temperature is high. And then uh, you know the mass of the molecule, the atoms, and you can capture this wavelength. So this wavelength is actually very, very small, right? That's why you don't see this as a wave, right? You just see this as a particle. And however, if you reduce the temperature, and then so when temperature becomes very, very low, and then this uh, uh, wavelength actually can become comparable uh, to the intermolecule over interatom spacing, right? So when this happens, and then actually you can see uh, all these particles as a wave, right? So, and then each particle we have uh, like a wave, and then if you cool the temperature further and uh, under a certain condition, and then what happens that, uh, so all these waves will interact with each other, so form a giant wave. So this means that uh, for all these individual waves, and then they may have a different phase. So that's why uh, some stack, uh, uh, you know, if you compare to light, for example, we have a spontaneous light, is something like this because each photon have a different phase, right? 
and so you can see the light uh, as a wave, but they're coherent, incoherent. Okay? However, uh, when you reach this uh, both uh, Einstein condensation situation, what happens that uh, so all the phase, the phases of all the small waves become the same. So eventually it becomes a giant wave. This is called both Einstein condensation. It's a very famous phenomenon uh, predicted by both in Einstein a long time ago. And then uh, there was uh, uh, this experiment we uh, proved or uh, verified after uh, people could achieve this very low temperature. Right. Um, okay. So now uh, with this uh, concept, now uh, we talk about uh, lattice vibration. And then so when we talk about lattice vibrations, basically we introduce the concept of wave, right? And so wave can be in all different forms, uh, but the simplest wave basically uh, is a plane wave, okay? So um, before we talk about this uh, the plane wave, I just uh, go back to uh, what I explained in the previous lecture uh, about this um, um, and plane uh, in the three-dimensional system is mathematically so how do we define this, all right? So um, as I explained uh, in lecture one, so if we have a uh, If we have a plane uh, in the XYZ coordinate system, right? So, say for example, it's something you know, like this one. Uh, and then, uh, so this is XYZ. And then this plane can always be defined mathematically uh, by using this very simple equation first order, AX plus BY plus CZ plus D uh, equals zero, right? So, once you have this, and then we can define uh, a normal vector. Uh, which is perpendicular to this plane. So this normal vector, so if I normalize this, so it'll be, and so th this is the gradient, right? So the gradient, so that's why you get uh, A, B, C, and then the magnitude of this, All right? So this is basically is a unit vector, which is perpendicular to the plane, we call normal vector, right? So uh, that basically is uh, the general case, right? Of plane uh, in 3D uh, space. So a plane wave uh, is typically uh, can be written as so. This basically have an amplitude, right? The amplitude. Um, uh, we just look at the, the general uh, wave first. So basically, you have uh, the amplitude, and then uh, so this amplitude is given by and a constant, okay, and multiplied by a phase vector we call phi x y z. Um, and, and then, so uh, when, uh, of course, if it's a wave, and then you still have a, a something as a T, which is time, right? So if you don't have a, if we don't have T here, that'll be a stationary. That's why in general, sorry, there's a T here. So X, Y, Z, T. So uh, this basically is the phase of the wave. And then this is the amplitude, right? Um, the wave actually is defined. So we, something we call, we define the wave front. So the wave front is defined as, so this wave front is an important concept. The wave front is defined by that this phi, so x, y, z, t, be a constant. So this wave front. So this means that at a certain instant of time, it's mean you fix t, and then you get a, uh, if you fix t, and then you only get a phi x, y, z equals c. This means it's a function of x, y, z only. And then this in general, or define a curved surface uh, in space, right? So this piece of mathematics is defined by this one. The shape of this, um, this, this is surface, this means the surface defined by wave front, which is a constant, and can be used to uh, define the wave. So if this is a, uh, is a, a, a plane, if this is a plane, and then we call it a plane wave. So if this has a spherical surface, if it per and then we call this a uh, spherical wave, right? So basically, it's the shape of the wave front, right? So if you understand this, so now this is a general case. Now we look at a, a, a plane wave. So a plane wave basically we define as A equals A naught. So of course, A can be any physical quantity, right? Can be electric field and whatever you, you want to use, okay? Can be lattice vibration amplitude. And then, so we begin by I. So you can put the negative sign here or without negative sign. It doesn't matter. It just indicates where in the wave will propagate. Okay, so and then it's given by k, which is a we call wave vector, 
and then dot r minus omega t. So this would define a plane wave. So why this is a plane wave? Uh, so now we look at this, this is phi, right? So let this be constant. So you have a k dot r minus omega t, uh, which is a constant, okay? So now at uh, any instant of time, so at fixed time, then of course I have k dot r, which is given by c plus omega t, c t1, is the it's just fixed uh, time, right? And then uh, this, of course, uh, the whole thing, the omega is the frequency. If you know the frequency, the whole thing put together is not a constant, right? It's just like this. So now with this, of course, you expand this one, you have a k x x plus a k y y plus k z z and then minus c y equal zero. So this basically is a plane, right? So you just compare this one with general definition. So A is kx, right? And B is ky. And C is kz. And then the minus c1 basically d, right? And then and what's the normal direction of this plane? And the normal direction of this plane, you just follow uh, this definition, right? You just normalize it, the unit vector. And then it's given by kx, ky, and then kz. So we normalize this and normalize by amplitude of k is k, right? It's a root square and kx square plus ky square because it's a k. So this basically is a normal uh, to this plane, which is is k, right? If you don't normalize, it's just k, right? So this means that uh, 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 this define a plane wave, and then this plane wave. Uh, uh, has uh, y called plane wave because the wave front is a plane, and then uh, when the wave is moving, basically uh, we are talking about is a uh, is a uh, is a wave front is moving, right? So this wave front is moving. So when wave front moving in what direction? Of velocity is in k direction. So this means that uh, this k basically defines the direction in which the, the the wave will move. So that's why it's called plane wave. Uh, this is three D case. Um, if it's a uh, one um, D, and the one D, of course, your K is in one direction, and then just have you know K X minus omega T or K Y minus omega T, and depending on in which direction uh, the plane is moving or the wave is moving, right? So with this, and then we come back to uh, this uh, uh, plane wave definition. So this means that uh, mathematically, and so we can define. So mathematically, and we can define this plane wave uh, just like this. So if I have a, a one-dimensional uh, plane wave propagated in, in x direction, and then we just the, write this as a equals a naught e to the power i kx minus omega t, right? And then uh, plus phi. Okay, this is what we have. Okay. Um, so this phi is just a phase, uh, which is initial phase, which is not so important. Right, so now uh, you can put this one zero um, because uh, depending on your know, reference. So the absolute phase of uh, uh, a wave is not so important. The, the relative phase is important, right? Because when you talk about the wave interaction, the interaction between two waves, we also talk about the phase difference, right? Instead of absolute you know, phase. Okay, so uh, at a certain instant of time, and say for example t equal zero, and then of course you only have a, a kx here, right? So this would define, you can see there's a, a wave form uh, in a spatial uh, domain. This means uh, along axis, and uh, you see the distribution of this vibration amplitude, right? And then, the, of course, this is a periodical, and then the period, is, uh, the period is given by lambda. So lambda is a wavelength, right? And then k is related to this wavelength by this equation. So k is 2 pi over lambda. So the smaller lambda, the larger the k, right? Over Obviously, when lambda approach infinity and then k is zero, right? That basically there's no wave, right? Because uh, your period is infinite uh, long, this means no wave. Okay. And so omega uh, is a frequency called angular frequency, right? So angular frequency is given by 2 pi f, and f is the normal frequency. Normal frequency means it's the inverse of time. So 1 over 1 over its period of time, and then this is normal frequency. Okay. Um, 
then for uh, there, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, so uh, this is when t equals zero. So uh, when t is uh, changing, and then you can see that uh, uh, the wave actually is propagating uh, in space, right? That's very important. So this means that for, for you to have a wave, it's very important that the phase will change with respect to both spatial coordinates and the time. If the phase only uh, change with respect to spatial coordinates, then you have a stationary waveform, right? And if you, uh, if you, uh, uh, if the only change with respect to time, that's a time dependent signal, right? So it's, it's a normal time dependent signal. Uh, this means that uh, uh, there's no uh, spatial dependence. Again, this is not a, uh, a proper wave, okay? So a proper wave will always have a phase which is changing with respect to both time and, and then spatial coordinates. And the most important thing is the, the rate of change, the rate of change uh, in spatial domain and the rate of change in time domain are correlated with each other. That's very important. And then you have a wave. If they're not correlated, of course, you won't have a wave, right? So, and so this is K as a wave number is important. And the omega is angular frequency. And so the ratio of this tool actually is extremely important uh, when we talk about wave. So why the ratio of the two is so important? So basically it tells you how fast the wave can move, right? Because one is a change in the spatial domain, the other is a change in respect to time, right? So this, the ratio of these two change, uh, rate of change is to determine how fast the wave can propagate in space, right? So that basically given by omega OK. So this is called phase velocity. And then, uh, so this is called, uh, uh, and then the, the global velocity, later we'll talk about this is, uh, and d omega dk, this means the first order derivative of k with respect to omega, right? So why this is the uh, we uh, equals omega k is the phase velocity. And let's go back to uh, this one again. Okay, so now, since we have a plane wave, right? So now uh, it's a one dimensional, then look at one dimensional case. So we have a, a uh, given by a naught, and then e to the power of i, and kx and minus omega t uh, minus omega t and, and then plus five so it is you know ignore five okay so five is just a phase okay so this means that uh, and this phase uh, this phase basically given by uh, kx uh, minus uh, omega t and we let this be a constant and then this defines the uh, well, this, this defines the wave from, right? So now I differentiate this uh, from both sides in respect to t and say what you can have. So you differentiate this one in respect to t and then you have k uh, dx dt and then minus w that because it differentiate respect to t, right? And c is a constant, you get zero, okay? So now you see what you have. And then you have a dx and then dt, uh, which is by omega over k. So dx dt is making is basically it's the speed, right? It means uh, is how fast the uh, this is the move, uh, this wave is move uh, in the spatial domain, right? So uh, and then you get uh, this uh, omega k. Okay. This so this is called phase velocity. So why phase velocity? Because we calculate this one from the, this phase equation, right? And how fast and they can move. So basically the omega k. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, you, you can try to figure out, you know, this actually, you have a dimension of a lens or, uh, uh, if you just look at dimension, actually this is a lens or uh, what that uh, uh, time, right? So why is the case? And uh, because omega, you know, is uh, one over time, say for them, just look at dimension, okay? So one over time is a second, right? And then the K, K is the uh, uh, wave vector, so one over lens for them per use meter, right? And then you flip over and look at this dimension and you get a meter over a second. So basically the speed, right? So this is called phase velocity. So if you can understand this, so now we come back. So now we can see that uh, uh, as we, okay, so this is a, a phase velocity. And then uh, d omega dk is a group of velocity. We'll talk about this one later. So right now we're on the stop here, okay? 
So again, uh, for plain wave in uh, 3D case, this is uh, what I already explained. And so you have this, right? So now uh, you look at this is a, a, a moving wave front for 3D plane wave. You can see that um, in this case, your wave basically is moving this direction. And so these are the wave front, the planes uh, in color, right? Uh, this uh, blue and then the red. So blue, this color just indicate that uh, the face are different, but I can see this wave front or face plane are actually moving, right? The speed of this uh, moving uh, is given by omega over k. Okay. So now, and um, if you just look at uh, uh, this wave uh, in, uh, uh, just try to uh, look at this few uh, snapshots of this uh, uh, one-dimensional wave. So you can see that uh, if you focus on, and uh, if you don't focus on each point, just look at the overall uh, waveform, right? Uh, within this uh, range, you can see that uh, the waveform is changing. So basically means that uh, the wave actually is propagating in space. And again, if you focus on only one point, uh, so basically one point, in space, and then you can see that at this point actually is changing with special time. You can see a different time, and then this actually is taking place. So this means that uh, you have a change of uh, amplitude in both time and the uh, and then uh, spatial domain. That's the reason why you have a wave, right? Okay, so now uh, this wave, uh, if you only have a, a simple plane wave, uh, that's not very interesting and also uh, not very useful. So why this is the case is because that um, if you have a plane wave uh, and then they have a, a constant amplitude, okay? So, and then the wave basically is all like this. So this kind of wave is very boring. You know why? Uh, because it does not carry any information. It does not carry any uh, energy per se. Why? Uh, it's because that uh, if you um, take an average uh, of the uh, inf uh, energy contained by this, actually it's just a constant. Right, it doesn't carry anything. It doesn't carry any information because uh, if you look at the average of this, there's no change, right? So uh, the, the wave which you, uh, will be very interesting, will be very useful is something like, uh, for example, you may have a wave, uh, for example, with a, a different frequency in a different range. Uh, this will be interesting, right? And or you have a different amplitude, right? And then this also will be interesting. Why? Because this will carry information depending on what kind of modulation you have, in the frequency, in the amplitude, or in the phase, and then uh, you can have uh, uh, information, right? So these are typically called wave packet because you can have each you know, packet which is you know, moving, right? So this will give you, uh, uh, give you a way to, uh, to propagate information and the energy in space, right? That's very important, okay? So and to do this actually not so difficult. We just need to uh, add two waves with a slightly different uh, um, wave number and the frequency, and then you can have this kind of wave packets. So, so to look at it, just look at the superposition of uh, these two waves. So this is the one, the plane wave, and the wave uh, vector k, and then uh, uh, angular frequency omega. And I have another wave, a same amplitude. So this is A naught, A naught. Um, but K, uh, sorry, this is delta K, not that, uh, a, not, uh, not delta X, okay? So this could be delta K, okay? So now uh, you can see that, uh, and so, uh, and that omega also changed by delta omega. And you put this two, uh, let this two uh, wave interact with each other with a superposition of two waves. And so just do a, a little bit of uh, mathematical uh, operation. And then you get uh, uh, this expression, right? So you have uh, two terms. So in front of this uh, bracket, you have one term. So that this one basically, you can see that uh, it's, a, it's, um, it's a, the same uh, uh, plane wave of this one, right? Um, uh, so of course, as I just said, it does not carry any uh, significance. And the most important part, actually, this part. So this part, of course, this is a constant, right? Just can ignore it. But this part, you can see that uh, uh, we're uh, modulate. This will modulate, you know, this amplitude, right? So if you put this amplitude and this together, you can see the modulate amplitude. So that will give you uh, something called wave packet, right? And then again, uh, we can do the same thing. 
uh, we can try to find out uh, what's the uh, velocity, the velocity of uh, this phase propagation. And then we let this be a constant, right? And then you differentiate from both sides with t, then you will get a dx dt, which is uh, um, this one, right? It's a delta omega over delta k, okay? And so, but for the first part, and this basically is still omega k. So this is the phase velocity uh, we just talked about, right? And that basically, you can see that uh, is uh, all these small uh, high frequency uh, uh, components. This means that uh, you can see the very, you know, very fast, that's phase velocity. And then this part, you let this be constant, differentiate from both sides. And then you get a, a velocity we call group velocity, we call Vg, uh, which is delta omega over delta k. So when uh, you have a, a, a continuous distribution of omega and k, the delta omega and delta k can be very, very small. Then we just call it d omega dk as the first order derivative of omega with respect to k, right? And this is a very important uh, uh, quantity. So this is called group velocity. And then the group velocity and will carry and the energy of information. And then the phase velocity does not have much uh, physical uh, significance. Okay? And of course, when this d omega dk is a constant, right, it's a constant, and then you go back to the phase velocity. This means the phase velocity and group velocity are the same. Okay? So uh, this, uh, when, when omega, uh, when omega is proportional to k, and then we call uh, non-dispersive media. It means that uh, 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 this media does not have any, uh, uh, so uh, basically the frequency is not even on the wave number. So it means the wave is different, the wavelengths propagating in the media will have the same uh, angular frequency. So this kind of uh, wave we call non-dispersive, or this kind of media called non-dispersive media. Uh, so when d omega dk, um, when omega is not proportional to k, and then we see that uh, uh, this media is a dispersive media, right? And then the media, and then the wave group velocity and the phase velocity, you know, will be different, okay? So now, once you understand this, so now we look at uh, uh, how and we can use this basic concept to describe the lattice vibration uh, inside the solids. So and first, we start from a classical physics first. And so this means that uh, we just treat this as solid as a continuous elastic media. So this means that uh, we ignore the discreteness of the atoms, right? We just treat this, uh, 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 this uh, solid state as a continuous media or material, okay? So in this case, uh, suppose that um, we, um, we have a um, one-dimensional uh, solid, uh, uh, solid, and so basically it can be a, a rod, right? And then the vibration of this rod uh, can be described by uh, this very simple, you know, wave equation. Okay. So before I talk about this wave equation, I need to uh, explain to you that uh, uh, in the in quantum, uh, sorry, in the uh, in physics um, or enduring, uh, we do have several uh, important uh, uh, equations. So uh, since we are dealing with a uh, uh, physical or enduring quantity in both the spatial and time domain, right? So that's why in general, uh, so in general, for example, uh, we just call it a for example, and then a is a function of x, y, and then z, and then t. Okay, so. Uh, and of course, uh, you can differentiate this one uh, with respect to t, right? And also, you can differentiate this one with respect to x, y, and z. And so, and so, of course, you can have second order, right? So, with respect to time, so you can have uh, this one, right? And also, you can have, uh, an, you know, first order of this with respect to x, and then uh, with respect to y, with respect to z. And then typically, uh, this uh, first order um, duality with respect to spatial coordinates are not so um, important, right? And then we're only interested in, uh, for example, uh, this uh, first order, second order duality with respect to x, and then with respect to y, and then with uh, respect to z, right? And then we have another one, which is just called del square. So the del square 
uh, but there are square, uh, so A, B, C, we're talking about, uh, uh, so this three, and then you put together, right? So you have something mathematically, so you can define something like this, right? So now, and so by doing this, you can define all the different type of equations. So the first one is, uh, is this one. So this first order to respect to time, and so it's a proportional to the second order derivative. I see, look at one dimension first, but anyway, it's three dimensions the same, so we just ignore it, okay? So for example, uh, something like this one, okay? So, and this is a one type of equation um, uh, we call diffusion equation. So what this, um, so for example, uh, if, you, uh, if you have a, a, a metallic plate, say for example, all right? And then, uh, so you just try to heat up, heat up the plate at the center, and then heat will diffuse, right? So eventually, you can see that uh, the temperature uh, will increase in surrounding area as well, the heat will diffuse. So to model this process, and then, so this is the equation. So your A will be temperature, all right? So over, or you have a safer damper, a simple you know, container, right? So we have all this liquid, uh, liquid in this container. So now uh, the safer damper is a transparent, there's no color. And then you just drop a, 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 a drop uh, of a liquid with a C, uh, for example, uh, red color. And now of course, uh, the molecules will diffuse to surrounding areas, right? So this diffusion process, and then you can use this one. It's called diffusion equation, right? Now, the second equation, which is important, is what we are will be using today, is uh, this one. The second order derivative of this one, uh, with respect to time, is proportional to second order derivative uh, with respect to spatial coordinates. So this is the wave equation, right? So this is very important. So, and this is the wave equation. So why we, we have this kind of equation? Actually, if you go back and look at the, uh, the uh, plane wave, you already know, right? Because uh, the face of the plane wave is dependent on and time and then x equally, right? So that's why if you differentiate them and then and twice, you basically go back to the self. So that's why it's give you the wave equation. Okay. So later we'll look at this one. All right. And then uh, the third equation is uh, you ignore the time. Ignore the time basically uh, just let this one be uh, a constant. So it can be zero as well, right? So, uh, so if it's zero, uh, you have a, a Laplace equation, and then if it's a constant, you have a Poisson uh, equation, right? So this is basically what defines, say for example, uh, static electric field, right, in uh, in space, okay, uh, or static magnetic field in space. So these are very very important equations that you endure, right? So that's why I hope in future um, when you uh, look at uh, have this kind of equation immediately, you should know that this is a diffusion equation. Right, to, to describe a diffusion process in, in, in during the physics. And then you have this kind of equation, you immediately should know that it is a wave equation, right? And then this one basically uh, is a, a, a Laplace when this is zero or a Poisson equation when this is not equal to zero, right? So these are very, very you know, important. Okay, um, so if you, and uh, of course we do have other you know, type of equation, for example, uh, we have this uh, continuity equation and the continuity equation typically uh, you will, uh, for example, relate uh, uh, the first order with respect to time with, uh, you know, first order with uh, uh, respect to uh, spatial coordinates. Of course, you have a, a divergence and then a curves, all of this. I will not go to that details, right? So if you understand this, so now come back uh, to look at, uh, uh, so this case. So now uh, the question we have at hand, and basically is a vibration uh, of this rod, uh, which is a, uh, uh, one dimensional object, right? And then vibration amplitude we call u, and u is a function of x and t. So now we have uh, at the left hand side, we have a second order derivative of u with respect to time. And right hand side, we have second order derivative of u with respect to x, right? And then in front of this, basically e over rho is a constant. So obviously, this is a wave equation, right? So this means uh, we have a lattice uh, vibration wave uh, inside this ground. And then e actually is called Young's modulus. And so basically uh, define the strength of the material and the rho is the mass density, right? So E over rho literally know that uh, uh, it's uh, related to uh, your uh, speed. So phase velocity of the wave, okay? So now uh, if we 
uh, since we are interested in that, we know that anyway, uh, the general solution of this one will be a plane wave. And uh, so the general solution of this will be uh, something like this one, which is a plane wave. And of course, uh, in mathematics, how do we uh, find out this general solution? Uh, we use something we call a separation of a variable method. As in mathematics, we're not uh, uh, go back to look at the mathematics again. Uh, but if you're interested in this, you can read some textbooks, right? And then we just use a separation uh, called separation of variable method. And then immediately, you can find the general solution, which is something like this one. Okay, you can try to verify this one. You substitute this in here, all right? You differentiate this one twice with respect to t, uh, since you don't have t here, right? And then, of course, you just get the omega square, right? And then multiply by this one itself. And then you different this one with respect twice with x, you just get q square, right? So, so here are you q, but the, uh, so uh, just now in general, for we use k, right? Uh, but uh, for less vibration or four nodes, we just use Q, but Q is a wave vector. Anyway, uh, there's no uh, uh, reason why we do it, it's just by convention. It's just taken as K as a wave vector anyway, all right? So now, and, and then from sub to in, and then you can find a relation between uh, this uh, um, Q, Q, and, and then uh, this, uh, uh, sorry, this uh, uh, V, okay? So how to do that? Uh, so. Uh, maybe I just write here. You substitute this in here. Uh, substitute substitute uh, this one in here, and then you get uh, uh, left hand side. You have uh, uh, basically, and so uh, since so once you you different ones you get i minus omega, and different ones again get another i minus omega. So i squared minus one says so have a minus omega square, and then u right. So, and then right hand side, you have E over rho. And again, you have a, a minus, and so Q square, right? And then U. So this U, this U cancel out. And then this one, and this one cancel out, right? So now, uh, so what do you have? You have, uh, and so, uh, so E over rho, and which is uh, uh, given by an omega square over q square, right? So this basically is the speed square, right? So because omega q is a phase velocity. So that's why uh, you get a phase velocity which is given by rho square e over rho. So that basically is this one, right? That's how you can get this. Okay, so now uh, you can see that uh, uh, if you have a very stiff material, and then you can see that uh, uh, the sound speed, because the vibration is the sound, right, uh, will be faster, right? And also, and the dense of the material is a larger the row, and then the smaller this uh, in the vibration speed, phase, phase velocity, right? That's what you have, okay? So now, um, if you look at the relationship between omega Q, so the omega and the Q, uh, basically, and it's given by, and now you have a, so omega, you just, uh, you know, get from here, okay? So omega basically is given by uh, rho square e or rho, and then uh, q, right? And then, so of course, uh, this basically is a, a phase velocity. So you just get uh, omega, which is a phase velocity, is q. So you can see that uh, uh, you have a linear uh, uh, dispersion. This means that omega is a function of Q, All right? So uh, this is a, you know, a very important. And, and then um, you can see the slope of this, so basically is the phase velocity, right? This is what we obtain, okay? So now I need to speak a little bit about this um, uh, omega Q uh, relationship. Okay, I need to use this. Uh, So now in classical physics, uh, say for example, um, if you have a particle, uh, just something like this one, and then this particle is moving, uh, for example, in space, right? And so what do you want to know about this particle? So of course, you want to know, so, uh, so where this particle is, so position vector. And then uh, how fast it's moving, and uh, whether there's any acceleration or not, 
right? So typically, and and if you know this, and also you know the initial condition, this is initially where the particle is located, and then what's the initial velocity. So in principle, you can find out this particle at uh, you know any place, and at, so at any time, right? So then you specify this particle, right? You can find out velocity, you can find position, and you can find the uh, acceleration. Um, but uh, if you have a wave, then you know, what do you want to know? Uh, sorry, enjoys. You have a wave, so what do you want to know? And of course, if you just look at the plane wave, right? If you look at a plane wave, and then uh, you may have something like uh, a equals a naught e to power and k uh, r minus omega t, right? So if uh, uh, it's just a simple plane wave. And you don't want to know uh, uh, what's the amplitude because amplitude anyway is just a constant, right? And it, it's not very uh, interesting, right? And also, and uh, if you if k and omega uh, they are just proportional to each other, and this all this just give you a plane wave, right? And so that's why it's not very interesting. So what we are interested in is actually is how a wave will propagate in a different type of media. And a different type of media will have a different property, right? And then this different type of media will define what kind of wave which you are propagate and how it will propagate inside this medium. And then, but what determines this basically is the omega as a function of k, right? So, so omega as a function of k. So, of course, uh, for phonon, uh, we use uh, omega as a function of q. So, this is called dispersion. So, in this whole um, uh, in this whole uh, uh, lecture, right? So we'll talk a lot about this one. And so basically, uh, we have uh, two different uh, uh, type of dispersion. Okay, one we call linear, and that means that uh, if we have a particle, which uh, a quasi particle, which does not have a, a mass, uh, for example, uh, photon, right? And then uh, sorry, photon. And then a phonon. So this these are a type of uh, quasi particles which don't have a mass. So for this kind of particles, this is a wave, right? We just want to know uh, so called uh, k over q. Anyway, you can use either k over q, okay? And then omega relationship for dispersion. So for example, for uh, that's a vibration in a continuous medium, uh, you have this linear dispersion, right? So we just want to know this because once we know this, we know the property of the wave. We don't need to know what's absolute value of the amplitude because that's not so interesting, right? And, and this omega k dispersion will determine how information or energy will propagate inside this material, right? That's the reason why we are interested in this. And then for uh, particles like an electron, uh, which has a mass, and then we are interested in the dispersion we call energy ek dispersion so basically uh, so uh, what's the relationship between energy and then k and so once we know this and then in the later part of this module you know that uh, uh, we will know uh, the effective mass this means that uh, once we know effective mass we will know how this electron will move uh, in different direction inside the crystal so this means that uh, for wave for particle we want to know where it is and then what's the velocity, what's the acceleration. But for wave, we are simply interested in the EK dispersion or omega K dispersion or omega Q dispersion. This means is how the frequency or energy will depend on the wave number, right? So again, I hope you understand that the wave number is related to the wavelength by this relation, right? So this means uh, basically it tells you wave with different uh, uh, wavelengths will propagate and with a different velocity uh, inside the media. So this is what I want to know, right? Okay, so if you understand this, so now um, let's come back to, uh, okay, this is that again. So this means that for uh, a lateral vibration, if you use a continuous uh, uh, medium um, approximation, and you get this kind of a linear you know, relation, right? It's what we obtained. Okay, so now, and we look at the real solid because the real solid uh, consists of you know atoms, right? So um, so basically we we'll see to what degree 
and the continuous medium uh, approximation we just used is still applicable, right? So we look at a very simple uh, material we call a monatomic, monatomic chain. So basically you have a one dimensional atomic chain uh, consists of a single type of atom, right? They have the same mass. And, and at the equilibrium state, at the equilibrium state, and so all the atoms are uh, fixed at a certain you know, position. Right, so uh, suppose that uh, this is ideally suppose this is at zero temperature, and then you turn on the temperature, so it means the temperature becomes finite, and then all these uh, all these atoms will immediately will start to move around. Right, so uh, uh, since we are um, uh, only interested in, uh, for example, in this case, okay, uh, of course uh, atom can move in different directions, but here, if suppose we are only interested in uh, this longitudinal motion first, so uh, for this longitudinal motion. We introduce uh, okay, uh, this um, uh, relative motion from the uh, individual uh, equilibrium position, right? So now to do this, we just give it the index of the atoms. So we focus on this one first, we call atom S, and then uh, the atom next to this at the left hand side, we call S minus one, right hand side, S plus one, right? And then just move on. So for example, this S plus P. And so equilibrium, uh, at the equilibrium state, the spacing is A, right? So now when uh, this uh, uh, S moves to the right-hand side by US, and this is by US minus one, and this is uh, US plus two plus uh, US plus one, and this is US plus P, right? So basically all this U represents the relative uh, motion of displacement, sorry, displacement of the atom from the uh, original equilibrium position. So now, uh, since this is uh, a more displacement is very, very small, and then we can use first order uh, um, approximation. So this means that uh, we just uh, treat all this in, uh, interaction as a spring, right, as a spring. So uh, when this moment is small, and if you use this spring model, and then basically we can uh, apply Hooke's law. So the Hooke's law is tells you that uh, uh, when all these atoms are moving out of the equilibrium position, and then there, there will be a restoring force uh, to bring all this atom back. The restoring force is uh, uh, proportional to the displacement, uh, but they have a negative sign, right? So this means that uh, if your net movement is towards the left-hand side, the force will be towards the right-hand side, right? And the vice versa, okay? So, and then to describe this movement, uh, so Hooke's law is just for you to calculate what's a net force uh, acting on a, a specific atom. Uh, but uh, this, to describe the kinetics, and then you need to apply Newton's second law. So Newton's second law tells you that uh, the mass, just focus on C, for example, this S atom S, and multiply by the acceleration. So that's basically is US uh, double prime, so second order due to its relative time. And it should be equal to the net force uh, exerted or acting on this atom. So the net force and basically come from the spring. So you have so many different interactions. So uh, for from uh, each uh, atom, and then there will be interaction, right? So for example, if you look at uh, uh, so S plus one, and then this interaction, and then S minus one is interaction, and S plus P is another interaction. So that's why in general, we just consider this S plus P atom. So if this S plus P atom is uh, moving to the right direction by this amount, right? And then, uh, so, and then this is moving to the right direction by this amount. And then the difference between this uh, uh, basically uh, will be uh, uh, this one minus this one, right? This one minus this one. And then you add a negative sign because it's the Hooke's law, right? So that will bring you back. So uh, you, you remove the negative sign, and that will be this one minus this one, right? So that's what it's. So now you can see that uh, uh, if this is larger than this, if this is larger than this, and then what happens? And then, uh, and then basically this will be positive, and this means that this atom will move to this side, right? So if this is more than this, and then this will just you know be come back, it's something like this, okay? And then this is CP is the spring constant, it's according to the spring constant, which is your first constant, if I just like a spring constant, right? And then you sum this P uh, from a zero, uh, from a one, uh, from this side, okay, from one to positive infinity, and the other side is from minus one to negative infinity, 
right? Just do that. So um, if you don't have any, if you don't put any constraint to this, to solve this, of course, it's very complicated, right? You have a, a large number of uh, symmetric equations, right? And then the uh, infinite number of uh, uh, variables. That's why it's impossible to solve. So however, um, since it's a crystal, right? And it must satisfy certain priority conditions. So this means that uh, uh, and the amplitude, right? So the amplitude uh, of this vibration must be written to the position, the position of this atom. So the position of the atom, uh, if we use an index S to indicate that atom S, and then the position basically can be given as an S multiplied by A, and the A is uh, that's the spacing, right? And then we just substitute this one here. So now you can see that, uh, and so this uh, uh, the moment, <clears throat> this uh, the um, moment of each atom is correlated with each other. So only when this happens, it gives a wave. And then what happens to uh, the moment that which are not correlated with each other? This means there's no phase coherence uh, correlation. There's no phase correlation. Uh, even you can excite that kind of motion, and then it will die off very quickly, right? So that's the reason why we don't need to. Uh, think about that, that kind of vibration. So we only look at the vibration uh, in which the phase of the uh, atoms are correlated, right? The phases of the atoms are correlated with each other. And then this will give you a sustainable uh, less vibration. So that is mathematically given this way. So when they have this, and then we can substitute this one into the previous equation. So, uh, so that previous basically just uh, rewrite the equation here, right? It's Newton's second law. And then we substitute this one in here. And then, uh, so you can do this by yourself, okay, so, uh, so if it's S plus P, so basically you just need to have a, um, a plus P here, right? And then, uh, then minus this one, so this will be, uh, eventually you take out this one, take out this one from bracket for here, and then, so this term you have an additional phase, which is due to this uh, uh, PA, right? That's why I have a QPA, so QPA, so we give here, right? And so this you different ties with respect to time, and then basically different this one with some time you have a, uh, so twice you get a, a different ones you get a minus omega i twice basically you get the two minus omega i, and then so minus omega minus omega you get an omega square but the i square is minus one that's why you have minus omega, m omega square and then us right so you have this one, and this is very still difficult to solve uh, although uh, you already remove uh, this uh, uh, differentiation terms. And, uh, but it, it's still difficult to solve. So now, um, in practice, we don't need to uh, look at interaction beyond the nearest neighbor, right? So that's why uh, the dominant interaction will come from nearest neighbor. That's why we only take into account the nearest neighbor. So nearest neighbor, we only have two uh, atoms. So one is S plus one, the other is uh, one S minus one, right? So that's why we just expand this one and this one. So now, and so when P is minus one, Right, and then uh, you have uh, one term here and another term here, right? So when p is plus one, you still have one term here. Again, you still have minus one here. So that's why you need to have a minus two. And but uh, this this is from uh, uh, p equals one. This is uh, from p equals minus one. So this minus two because the, the uh, one of the minus one from uh, p equals one, and the other minus one come from uh, p equals uh, minus one, right? So minus two. Okay. So now this, you can rearrange this. And uh, so I believe you know how to do this. And then you'll get, um, <clears throat> so, so this, and you can uh, rearrange uh, this one. And then you should be able to, uh, you know, get this, right? Uh, I hope uh, you know uh, how to do this by yourself, right? And so E, I, and Q, A, uh, basically, uh, you have a cosine uh, QA plus uh, uh, sine QA, I sine QA, right? So that's why you eventually have two uh, cosine QA. So if you do this, you have a, okay, here, so you have a cosine QA and plus I sine QA and then plus a cosine QA minus i sine q a and then minus two. So this one, this one cancel out, right? So there's a two. So that's why you just take out two, and you have two 
uh, cosine QA, then minus one, okay? And then you convert this, convert this into uh, sine QA or two, right? And then, then uh, square, okay? And then you take square root. So uh, when you take square root, and because you had to find out what's the omega, right? So when you take, uh, so this is causing QA minus one, you just put it over, get a minus, put a minus here, and I have a minus E minus cosine uh, QA. E minus cosine QA, you convert to a sine QA over two, that minus signs cancel out with it, you know, this minus sign, right? And then you take a square root, okay? So when you take a square root, and then, okay, uh, you need to uh, put the uh, absolute, absolute sign here, that's because that uh, omega cannot be negative. Okay, so omega is always positive. You cannot have a, a negative you know, frequency, right? That's why I put an uh, absolute sign there. So this will be So now what is this? Uh, this basically is the dispersion uh, which we are interested in. So omega is a function of Q, right? Why? Because um, uh, you can look at this one here. Okay, so C1 is a constant. It's the first constant. Four, of course, constant. M is a mass constant. And A is a lattice spacing constant. Two is constant. That's why, so the only variable you have here is Q. So omega is a function of Q. It's about omega equals omega Q. So this basically is a dispersion which we want to find out. So if you sketch out this one here, so this is what we have, okay? Since the sine is a, is a periodic function, that's why when Q change, and then you get this kind of a periodical distribution of omega, it will just continue, right? So however, we will not be interested in uh, this EK, EK dispersion in all the uh, different K, Q values. We are only interested in this one within this region, which we call first brilliant zone. Right, so they don't have why this is called first ground zone, and that because and any uh, mode of vibration. So mode of vibration basically is a a, a, a a mode of vibration which is defined by omega and the Q values. So any other modes which uh, outside this first ground zone uh, can be mapped into first ground zone. So later we'll show you. Right, but anyway, we just look at this dispersion first. You can see that. Uh, and uh, at a small q, and so more or less you see uh, it's linear. So later look at this one. And then after that, uh, anyway, this is the omega increases q. So but after it reaches um, uh, the boundary, the first random boundary, and it reaches maximum, and then it will decrease again. And then this will be just repeated, right? Okay, so now we look at the first brown zone. This is what we started in the lecture one. Uh, so now we have uh, this um, very simple uh, one-dimensional lattice in real space, right? And so same type of atom, and then the space in between each atom is A. And then, uh, remember, we can have another uh, type of lattice we call reciprocal lattice, right? For the same uh, uh, crystal. And then so that reciprocal lattice basically, since this is one-dimensional, and then the reciprocal lattice is also one-dimensional, right? So now we have uh, uh, this blue, all these blue uh, points, these are lattice point in the reciprocal space, right? So now we just choose one of them, see here, so let's focus on this reciprocal lattice point. Then we try to connect this one with the nearest neighbor reciprocal lattice point, the one here, and then another one here, right? And then we form the, find the line, which is, uh, which bisects these uh, line segments, which will be here, right? And of course, another one will be here. So then this region, this means from here to here, so this is called first brown zone, okay? And then the second brown zone, and then we need to look at the, uh, the second nearest neighbor, this will be this one. And then the line which is bisecting, this is second uh, nearest neighbor line, that will be this one, so it will be here, right? And similarly, for this one, second nearest neighbor is here, and then the, the line bisecting this will be here. So now, so from here to here, this blue region, and this one from here to here, this blue region. So this will be second brown zone. And similarly, just continue, and then you'll find out this will be a third brown zone, and then this also third brown zone, right, which is here. So that's why the first brown zone, now, since this lattice space in A, and then 
this uh, um, uh, reciprocal lattice. And so the transition vector basically will be two pi over a, that's your k, right? Because this a, remember this is your b, right? So this is a1, so this is a b1, right? So a dot b basically two pi, right? That's why I have two pi here. So if this two pi over a, and this must be pi over a, so then this will be minus pi over a. So this is the first Brillouin zone. That's why your first Brillouin zone basically is from here, minus pi over a to pi over a, right? This one. Okay. So we are only interested in the um, omega q dispersion inside the first Brillouin zone. Okay. And so now, what does this uh, um, omega q dispersion mean? What's the physical significance? As I explained um, previously, so the omega k dispersion basically will tell you how fast the wave will move inside this medium. So this means that each point, each point on this curve represents a specific mode of vibration. Uh, that web, uh, mode of vibration is determined by the wave vector q and the frequency omega, right? And then the slope, the slope near this point will determine how fast the wave will move, right? So, so each point represents a mode of vibration, okay? This is what you should understand. Now, we look at what happens to this one. Of course, this also represents one mode of vibration, but this can be mapped back to this one by, you just move this one by translation with a k. k, remember, is tau pi or a. k is tau pi or a. And then you come back here. So the mode of vibration represents by this point exactly the same as the one represents by this point, right? Why is this the case? And then you can substitute this one into uh, this uh, here, right? So you have Q, Q, XS minus, you know, omega T, and the XS is XA, right? So that's why, and so if you substitute here, um, uh, let me see, uh, I will just uh, come back here and then show you that, uh, so, and if you have a U, which is a U naught, and so you have a, a E to the power I, and so you have a Q, XS, right? So XS, this is SA, and then uh, minus uh, omega T, right? So now suppose that uh, uh, you, you so, so if this is UQ, and you have this one, right? So now what happens about UQ plus K? Okay, so u q plus k, you see have a u naught, and then e to the power of, uh, so now, so here you have a, a, a q s a, then plus another k, right, because this is k here, right? So k s a, and then minus omega t, right? So now, so basically, so this is equal to, and so uh, e to the power k i, K S A and then U Q, right? So U Q is this one, right? So and then what is this? So what is this? So you can calculate. So K S A equals a two pi over A S A. So A A cancels out. So you have a, a S times two pi, and then S is an integer. So that's why uh, you basically this fifth factor you have a. Uh, a multiple of two pi. Of course, this is one, right? So that's this is exactly one. So you get this one. So this means that uh, although uh, this um, k is different, q is different, but the omega is the same, and eventually, uh, eventually, uh, the vibration u q and the u q plus k are exactly the same. So that's the reason why you don't need to worry about uh, you know this point. Right, just in the map here, that's it, okay? So, and to understand this, another way to understand this, you can try to and uh, understand this in uh, look at this real vibrations, what happens. So, um, we look at a, a one, uh, one uh, uh, vibration mode, uh, for example, 
and we fixed. So now this is a snapshot at a certain instant of time. That's why we remove the time. We want to look at the uh, atom vibration in real space, right? The time is gone. Now, and then 2 pi over 4a is just a q, right? It's a, a certain motor vibration. So if you sketch out this one, that be this one, this is a red curve. Okay, it turned by this q. Now, if you plus this, plus the 2 pi over you see the k, the transition vector, right? And then you, you get a, another wave, which is the blue wave. So this is a blue wave. Now, looks like uh, the blue wave is different from this red wave, right? But actually it's not. You know why? Because we are only focused on the real movement of the atoms. So that's why if you look at the real movement of the atoms, actually, and so um, and the, the red the wave and the blue wave, they're actually exactly the same. Why? For example, if you look at the uh, amplitude, so the amplitude of this red wave and the blue wave are the same. So we look at the face. The face actually is exactly the same. So for example, in this one, they're here. And so and if you follow the blue wave, they are going to move up, right? And then follow the red wave also move up. So here, red wave, you, you reach a maximum. The blue wave, you also reach a maximum. When you come back, red wave is zero. And then the blue wave also zero. And come here, this is a negative maximum for the red wave, also a negative maximum for the blue wave. Right, then again come to zero and then maximum of zero and negative maximum of zero. Yeah, exactly the same, right? So uh, actually signal processing, if you are familiar with signal processing uh, in electrical engineering, uh, you should learn something like uh, this uh, uh, Nyquist or uh, Nyquist uh, uh, principle, right? And then basically you tell you something like over sampling. If you have a signal and you want to do sampling, uh, you can choose a certain uh, uh, frequency. So if your sampling frequency is uh, at least uh, uh, equal to or, or larger than two times the bandwidth, right? And then you should be able to get back your, your signal. And then if you increase the sampling frequency further, it won't help you anyway, right? Uh, but if it's more than that, and then you have the problem, okay? So, uh, so this basically tells you that uh, and if uh, the smallest wave you can have, and just imagine that the smallest wave you can have uh, in this uh, one-dimensional crystal, uh, the, the, sorry, the, 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 the smallest wavelength you can have. So basically, it's comparable to the spacing, right? Comparable to the spacing of the atom. So if your wavelength is already smaller than the, than the atomic spacing, of course, it's not meaningful. You know why? Because you cannot have another atom between these two, uh, which is still vibrating, right? Because it's just, it's just empty, right? So, but mathematically, uh, you still can use this and it's equivalent. So that's something, you know, uh, maybe a little bit difficult, you know, to understand, but I, I hope uh, you can uh, try to uh, roughly understand, you know, what's the, uh, behind, you know, this kind of phenomena, right? It's just like the oversampling, okay? Now, um, we just look at the, um, what happens uh, and at the vibration and at the boundary of this uh, uh, first grand zone, right? You can see that uh, the first grand zone somehow the frequency uh, saturates at certain value after it decreases, right? And what happens at the boundary is that um, uh, at the boundary, so basically at the first of the boundary, Q is a, a plus minus pi or A, right? So if you look at this, Q is a minus pi or A and a pi or A, right? So now we substitute in, we substitute this into um, this solution. And so this is Q, right? And so, and then we, uh, so this is Q, then we just substitute this in here, okay? And then we just get this one. Now, and so we look at this one, and this actually is a plus minus pi S pi. So S is an integer. So this means S can be a even number, an old number. So when S is a, a old number, and then basically this is an exponential uh, factor of given minus one. So if it's an even number, we just get one, right? So, so basically it tells you that, uh, um, at the boundary, and then um, the neighboring, the neighboring uh, atoms are moving in opposite direction. See, for example, if we have this one, this one, this one, right? So if this one is moving in this direction, and then this one will move in this direction, right? And then so so uh, this one, so this one of course will uh, move in this direction, right? In something like this. So, um, so eventually, you see what happens that um, since they are moving in opposite direction, and then uh, to uh, so this 
displacement sigma damper. Uh, if this displacement is called delta u uh, plus, and and then become a smaller, and then so this delta u, delta u become minus, this will become larger, right? So so eventually, and what happens is that the force, um, the force caused by and uh, this one and this one to this atom will be canceled with each other. So when they cancel out, and then what happens? So net force will be zero. So net force zero means that uh, the atom cannot move, right? So that when the atom cannot move, and then you have something called standing wave. Okay, you can have this is standing wave. So uh, this is standing wave. Uh, basically, means that the wave will not propagate, and you have a vibration that is a stationary, right? And in other words, the phase velocity will be zero. Okay, this is what I have, and actually you can see this from uh, uh, this one as well. From this uh, phase velocity, and sorry, growth velocity. So the growth velocity, you can see that uh, uh, you just need to differentiate this one to differentiate this one with respect to q, right? d omega dq is the growth velocity, right? So if you differentiate this one, then you get this. And if you substitute this uh, q equals plus minus pi or a here, uh, you get the plus minus uh, uh, pi or a, okay? And then cos and pi or a, of course, is zero. So this means the growth velocity is zero. So, so this means that at the boundary of first Brown zoom, and what happens that uh, uh, the wave will be reflected back. So the reflected wave and then uh, forward coming wave uh, interfere with each other, and this will generate a standing wave, right? And then something like this one. And so, of course, here it looks like the transverse wave, but anyway, uh, since the longitudinal wave is difficult to sketch out, but anyway, there's something you should have. And so here we deal with the longitudinal wave because we, we are talking about the, the moment uh, in the, uh, the vibration uh, along this direction, right? But here you can see the transfer direction. Anyway, this just show you how this standing wave will look like. So the atoms are not moving, right? But there is a vibration, okay? So this is called standing wave. So I hope you can see this. Now, and so how is this model related to the continuous media model? So the continuous media model, uh, we find out that uh, and the omega Q dispersion base is linear, right? So it's something like this one. And so for uh, this discrete uh, uh, atom model, and if we uh, let Q approach zero, right? And let Q approach zero or lambda approach infinity, and then we still get the same uh, uh, number. So basically, uh, you you let uh, uh, d omega dq is this one, right? So d omega dq that's a dispersion. So if you uh, sorry this one is omega q, okay? Omega q. So when omega when when q is very small and then q a over lambda. So if we just do this approximation and so q is very small, uh, so. And so what we have is that, uh, so we have a sign and QA over two, which is a approximately equal to QA over two, right? So just take the amplitude and then you get this one. So, uh, absolutely, okay. So then you get this one. So, and then this is a constant. So basically you can see that uh, uh, when Q is very small and approximately you have this linear dispersion Q by this blue line, right? So this is exactly the same as this one. Okay, this is a long wavelength. So why when uh, wavelengths of, when q approaches zero means that uh, lambda uh, approach uh, infinity? So why when lambda approaches infinity you have this? This is understandable, right? Because uh, uh, so if this is an atomic chain, right? So if lambda is approach infinity, basically you have a wave or something like uh, you know this one, right? So it's that's a, a very long wavelength and actually you cannot see it. So to all this atom, right? And then so this wave. Will not be able to see the discreteness of the atom. It's just to, to this wave, basically, it's just continuous, right? So, and of course, when your wave is a, uh, your wave has a, a very a much shorter wavelength, and of course, you see the discreteness of the atom, right? So, it's understandable. It means that uh, uh, when you uh, go to this uh, long wavelength approximation, and then this uh, discrete, uh, discrete model uh, or monotonic chain model is exactly the same as uh, this uh, continuous medium model, okay? Now, before we end this one, uh, we need to introduce uh, something which we will uh, use uh, later. And so now, although this is a continuous, 
And then we only need to uh, look at the mode of vibration inside the first brain zone, right? And however, if you really use this kind of uh, a continuous model, continuous model, and, and then and it seems that you have infinite number of modes, you have infinite number of modes inside the, uh, this uh, 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 first brain zone, right? But in actual case, what happened that um, and you always, your material always have uh, some sort of, you know, uh, finite size. So once you have a finite size, and then, so what happens that uh, the boundary will be fixed. So when boundary is fixed, then you'll see some sort of quantization of uh, this uh, lateral vibration. And so when we deal with this, and then the best way to, to, um, to look at this is uh, you can um, apply a certain boundary condition at the same time, and uh, you can still, um, Treat the material as infinitely large. So that kind of boundary condition uh, we call periodic boundary condition, which is very useful uh, when we, um, of course, in this model, in this model, we don't use it. For example, if you want to calculate uh, uh, the heat capacity using concept of form or whatever, and then you need to use this kind of boundary condition. So that boundary condition called foreign uh, one uh, common uh, periodic boundary condition. So if you do this, uh, and then we just, uh, you have an infinite uh, long atomic chain. Uh, but uh, we just uh, uh, take uh, a part of this from here, uh, which has uh, n atoms. The total length is n a, and then after that, uh, everything will be repeated by uh, this unit, and then you can go to infinity long, right? And so, if you apply periodic boundary condition, means we ask u to be same uh, for this atom and then this atom, and then you substitute in, in the here. Basically, u s must be u equals yeah, must equal equals the u must equal u s plus n, and then you find out that uh, uh, you get this kind of relationship. So this basically means that uh, uh, this must be multiple of two pi, right? So you get the two pi n, and then you find the q actually quantized, right? So now you can see that uh, uh, you can have n modes. So within the first brain zone, and then you have n modes. It's you know something like this kind of picture. So this means that uh, uh, you don't really to use this uh, um, uh, something like a, uh, continuous medium, uh, that kind of approximation. But when you look at uh, uh, the uh, every vibration mode inside the, you know, this first brain zone, you only need to use the uh, finite modes. And then the question is, does this affect the calculation of the physical quantity? Of course, it will not, it will not. And that basically, basically, I just tell you that uh, if you use, uh, 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 just like uh, you know, uh, the numerical calculation. Uh, some of you, uh, yeah, you're familiar with numerical calculation, right? And if you want to integrate uh, a function, and of course, uh, you can use a uh, uh, process in the mathematics. You can just uh, find what's the integral. And then for computer, do it. And how do you have to use a discrete method, right? Just uh, use approximation. You divide that uh, the error and the curve, right, by and uh, in, into many elements, right? And then you sum up the area of all these elements, you get approximate area. And it's still quite okay, right? It's something like this. It won't affect, uh, um, you know, the physical quantity which you are going to calculate. But uh, uh, it's very important uh, uh, to do so, so that uh, you, you can uh, have some sort of uh, um, simple way to uh, find out the physical quantity you want. Uh, although we don't uh, you, you this, uh, uh, lecture, but uh, if you uh, study solid physics, you find this would be you know, very useful. Okay, uh, let's just have a, a break uh, here, and then um, so after that, we'll look at uh, uh, and uh, that's vibration in a diatomic chain, right? Okay.